Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get rolling. Um, if anybody, and, and again, anybody who's just joined us, and it looks like there are quite a few of you who have come in the last few minutes here. Thank you so much for your attendance, of course, first of all. Um, and second of all, if you would like to submit questions, that's an important part of how this is going to go tonight. Um, please feel free to do so in the questions section of your webinar column there. You should have a tab kind of underneath um, some stats that has an opportunity to submit questions. You can actually do it two ways. One is the questions tab and the other is the chat tab. I'll be keeping an eye on both of them tonight. So, um, you know, either way you want to get it to me is totally fine. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. As we normally do with these things, we're going to go ahead and um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Sonoran Desert Institute first. We never really know where everybody has heard about these webinars, so um, we take this as an opportunity to kind of tell you who we are and what we do and who we serve. And then we'll talk a little bit about Kip as well and his background, but really I'm going to try to fly through those two things because we do have um, a ton of questions from last time that didn't get answered and also um, we want to get to everything that you guys have submitted already. So um, again, Sonoran Desert Institute School of Firearms Technology is um, an accredited college. It's online and specializes in firearms training programs. We offer degrees and certificate programs as well as standalone courses. Um, two of my, just I'm just going to go ahead and make all these things happen at once. Um, two of the programs offered here, the Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree and the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate program, um, are also uh, approved for use of your TA and VA benefits, and we do serve a large population of either active duty military students or veterans. Um, we are considered a very military friendly school. Of course, we do have students that are non-military as well. We love everybody equally. <laughs> so um, we want to make sure that it's easy for people to enroll and to have a successful time while they're in school. Um, we are we do offer some unique opportunities here as well and you'll see down there I've, I've put a little list up there of all of the programs and courses that are currently available um, we do have a gunsmithing certificate you'll see that third one down that's our non-credit course um, as well as a ballistics and reloading certificate which is a really neat little add-on um, we work with uh, Hornady for that one you get a lock and load press with that program that one's not approved for use of TA or VA but a neat little add-on um, if you're interested in reloading at all. Um, and then we do have currently three advanced armorers courses. Now these are unique in that you can take them as their own course or you can choose one of them as your capstone project which is um, a course that you'll take within your Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree program or the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate program. So you can take those three, AR-15, AR-10, 1911, one of those three as your capstone course, it's all included um, within your, you know, full program tuition cost, uh, or you can take those by themselves. And again, some people can, you can do both, you know, so if you choose to do the Air 15 as your capstone project and then want to go back and complete one or both of the other armor courses, that is totally fine as well. Um, if you do have any questions about SDI, what we do, any of the programming, um, please feel free to email me uh, or probably the, the best people to talk to about that is our admissions staff. That's admissions, A-D-M-I-S-S-I-O-N-S -S -S at sdi.edu. Or if that's too hard to, to list off, mine is Jennifer, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R at sdi.edu. Um, or you can visit the website. So if you have any questions at all, just let us know. As far as Kip goes, and I'll expand all that as well, um, and before I start this little background, I understand that we're going to be doing a little bit of a balancing act. I'm not sure how many people who are on tonight were on last month's as well. So I'm going to try to cover at least most of the bases that we did last night and then kind of delve into some of the other stuff that we didn't get into uh, last month. So um, Kip, first of all, thank you for being with us. Um, and you'll, you'll have to help me out in some of these details here. Kip is one of our instructors. Uh, of, and he's in the basic ballistics course, but Really why he's here tonight is because he's an absolute expert on the topic of starting up your own gunsmithing business. And you've had quite a few of them, is that right? Yeah, I have a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, again, as you can see here, um, a long and credentialed background in the gunsmithing industry started at 14, 
You can see all his certifications there. He's a certified NRA instructor with all of those additional certifications as well. Um, and what we're going to talk a lot about tonight, and Kip, I haven't even brought this up to you yet, but I've kind of been shuffling all these questions around. And I think a really good way to maybe divide it up is to go with three main tiers here, and that's going to be setting up a shop. So what it takes to make the decision, what type of shop, you know, should be in consideration, pros and cons of different things, promoting, how do you get your first client, that type of thing. And then big disclaimer here, a lot of people have asked about licensing, insurance, and other business types of considerations. And just so that everybody's clear, these will be Kip's personal opinions, not you know, not like legal re representations of what you should or should not be doing with your business. So when when people are asking about licensure and things like that, Kip, just make sure that we'll, we'll all understand here that this is your own personal opinion on things. Um, and of course, it's always best to talk to ex experts about things like taxes, <laughs> you know, insurance, Absolutely. things like that. Um, and then the third tier is probably going to be kind of what to offer in your shop and how to serve your clients. So if that sounds okay with you, um, we'll move in that direction. Does that sound sounds good? great? Great. Sure. Okay. So I want to um, start briefly with a little bit of your personal background as in how did you get into this? What made you decide to become a gunsmith? When you made that decision, what were your first steps? You know, that type of thing. Where And how did it kind of make you end up where you are today? So if you can catch us up on that, that'll give us some launching points. Well, it, it basically started for me when I was a pretty young kid. I was only about 10 years old or so when my dad started to teach me how to shoot, mm -hmm. yeah, as well as my godfather. Uh, my godfather, he shot competitions, did reloading, and uh, he used to build his own 1911s. So the fascination kind of started with those two. And then uh, as I got a little older, about 14, I met a man named Dave Young, who was a friend of our families, and his son and I were really close friends. And Dave was a master smith, and he worked for a place called American Wholesale, did warranty work and that kind of things. And he used to take us out uh, shooting and hunting and other things like that. But he, when we were at the house, he would often bring home, say, a, a new type of weapon or firearm, I should say. We don't use the term weapon. And uh, he would tear it down and have me and Rick, his son, put them back together and tell us if we wanted to go shooting that we had to put the gun back together that for before that weekend or we would have to also reload our own ammo and that kind of things. And it just kind of blossomed from there. Um, I always enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it was just, just a really neat, neat thing. It just really was a hobby more than anything. And as time grew, as the years went, I just stayed into it and kept the interest up in it and studied and studied. And, and I was one of those inquisitive kind of people that when I was really into something, read lots of books and things of that nature, as well as, you know, worked on my own guns. Um, I did some dignitary protection work when I was younger and you now some uh, private security sectors and things of that nature. So I was always like the you know, armor on different teams. Um, it grew from there. And then about three years ago, when I had the opportunity to open my own shop, I did. And started off with a very small shop and grew it into a bigger shop. Then went to a bigger shop and went to uh, back to a, a somewhat of a smaller shop, but also working with a, a, a good friend of mine in his firearm store. We kind of merged together, and that's where we're at now, and things are going great. Awesome. Um, and if you could kind of take us back to those very first moments. Let's let's go ahead and dive into this three-tier approach that we're going to try out for tonight. Sure. Um, when you decided you wanted to do this, um, what was the first – so when you opened the first shop, what was the first step for you? Well, the, the first step was uh, pretty much just making the decision of uh, how I was going to do it and uh, also just a lot of research, lots mm -hmm. of research. And I found out there wasn't a lot of research out there to be had. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, lot of gunsmiths out there who don't want to help you or talk to you because they don't want you know any competition or they just, for whatever reason, seem to think it's uh, uh, something they need to keep under their belt. 
and I, there was a lot of trial and error there. Um, there was a lot of good decisions and a lot of bad decisions. Sure. So that's that's kind of where it came. And, and uh, when I had the opportunity to get involved with SDI, uh, when Zeke pretty much recruited me, mm -hmm. uh, we we discussed many, many, many things and still do. And I just always wanted to be that kind of guy that and an instructor that, that uh, is not afraid to get out there and, and help the uh, students be able to get on their own their own path and don't make a lot of the same mistakes I did if we can help it and uh, I think that's where we're headed. And if you could, since we've, we've touched on these mistakes kind of before, but if you could go back and tell yourself starting out, you know, what, what are the things that you would tell yourself to do or not to do? Well, uh, probably the first thing I would say not to do is don't be in a rush to get too big too quick. Yeah. That is probably going to be your main thing. You're going to have to realize, especially when you're the only smith in the shop, that you just can't do everything. And you need to, to uh, write down the pros and cons of what you know how to do and what your strongest points are and focus on those strongest points. And also get a lot of feedback from the customers. Get a lot of feedback from the uh, gun stores you might deal with. Find out what kind of guns are selling. Find out what kind of uh, needs that their their clients are coming in and asking for. Uh, especially the shops that don't have a gunsmith, they'll be happy to tell you because they're they're looking for somebody to refer people to as well to offer more services to their clientele. Sure, absolutely. And I had one guy here that just asked, "How small did you start out?" I started out probably a. Um, I'd say probably about a six by six area in the garage. <laughs> I think that's pretty it's, common. From what I hear with grads yeah. and everything, I think that's a pretty common way to start it. Sure, and I'll tell you right now, I still have that shop, and I'm expanding on that shop, mm -hmm. and I still prefer to do a lot of work there at that shop because there's nobody to bother me. <laughs> I've got it set. Up, I've got it set up the way I want it set up, and I can just get in there and get my work done. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to be said for that. <laughs> um, now, I had one guy email in, and this is kind of a good seg segue for that. Um, a guy emailed in before the webinar, and he asked uh, he asked you to kind of discuss home-based gunsmithing shops, the pros and cons of that. And I know that we talked about this last time a little bit, too. I, I think you sung the praises of, a, of an at-home gun shop, if you can swing it, right? What's that? The... I, the the at-home gunsmithing shop. You're kind of a fan uh, of that idea, aren't you? I am. I am very absolutely. Um, you know, when you when you're like I said, when you're the gunsmith in your shop and you're starting out, the worst mistake you can do is go big quick. And you need to focus on your strengths and hone your skills. And being in a smaller shop will allow you to do that. You can, you can keep it very intimate for yourself to work in, and you can work through many gun shops, and which allows you to not be interfered with and allows you to concentrate. And I think that smaller shops sometimes is a great way to go for anybody. Um, you know, when you go into the bigger shops, it's usually because you're going to manufacture something, like my friends at Atlas, or you're going to do something on a very large scale. Um, you're going to have multiple people working for you, employees and that kind of thing. And, and so the pros of being in a small shop is that you, you, don't, you don't have to uh, worry about a lot of overhead, which can kill you. You know, rent's not cheap. And right. You, you're right. And when it's in part of your house, it's also some tax write-off for you. That gives you a little help, too. Yeah. But you... you you, like I said, you can set the shop up with just your basic things and get going. And the, the cons of it, I really don't see a lot of cons as far as, you know, you might be a little limited for space. Right. But you can fix that with a shed, with some other, other areas. There's, there's some ways you can go, mm -hmm. but you're still keeping that overhead down. And, and uh, that way you put more profit into your pocket. And... It gives you the chance, like I said, to just really hone your skills out, and that's what you really need to concentrate on. Sure. And I have a couple follow-up questions here from some of the participants. Um, what machines and or tools would be required to start something up like you did, something small, 
um, like your startup? I started out with a bench. Mm -hmm. I started out with a with a basic grinder and wire wheel combination. Mm -hmm. I had a bench top drill press and a full size drill press, and I had a, a bandsaw that I inherited from my father, and I had one. Let's see what was. Oh, I had a, a one-inch belt sander, and that right there, I still use all that today. <laughs> and the majority of my work is still done on some very basic machines, yep. the little mini drill press and things. Because, you know, guys, one thing you got to realize out there, and gals, is that you, you're going to be doing a lot of work that's very intimate in the gun anyway. You're going to do a lot of parts changing, but you're going to be doing a lot of repairing where you don't need a lot of these big tools. You don't, you're not going to need a million dollar CNC machine and all right. that yeah. unless you're just planning on jumping right in there and, and taking on the big boys. And I don't think that that's very practical considering that most of the CNCs I've looked at, quality ones, usually started over a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. And if we're trying to keep overhead down, <laughs> yes, exactly. maybe not the best move. Okay. Um, now here's an interesting one. Why is it so hard to start a home gun shop in this day and age, in your opinion? And do you, I mean, maybe you don't even agree with that, that statement, you know, what well, are your opinions on that? I think it has to do maybe with your demographics, but I live in a, a little town called Columbia, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And Columbia, Tennessee is not a real big town, uh, but my demographic here is we have a very lot of people who shoot guns and hunt and things of that nature. We also have a market of, um, of uh, 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 high school sports and stuff where kids shoot skeet and trap. And you add all that up and there's, there's actually a lot of clients here. And I think you can find that in every town you're in. You just have to know how to go about seeking out those clients or getting your name out there. And I think we're going to cover some of that tonight. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, and I think this will be probably, uh, this won't get us there, but I do have, this is along the same lines of what we've been talking about. If, if starting out of a shed at your house, if that's the direction that you're going, what do you think an appropriate size would be? Well, if you're going to have a little building or outcrop or shed, however you want to call it, um, I'd say you're probably going to need, I would at least do a 10 by 12 to start with. Okay. That way you've got room to set up a bench, you've got room to set up a few tools, um, and, and, and that way you can get started. And then as you grow, you can always build upon that. Like I said, you don't have to just start off with a whole bunch of tools. You're going to need more hand tools than you're going to need anything. Right. So. Right. And and I did want to jump in here too. Anybody who, who's attending tonight, um, we do have a little ebook with some schematics on different size workbenches. If that is something yes. that is interesting to you, or if you want that, I'd be happy to send it your way. Just email me, Jennifer at sdi.edu, J E N N I F E R S D I dot edu, and I'll get you that ebook. A lot of people may already have it, um, but if you don't, I'd be happy to send it your way. So that might help you. I like to point out something too. Those of you who can see the screen right now, Jennifer has a picture up right now. Mm -hmm. Let me pause. That is, that is my original bench. It's in the shop. Oh. It's still the one I'm working on today. That's great. Uh, you know, I've I've closed down the big the big uh, building that I had because the overhead was too much, yeah. and I wanted to size a little bit to concentrate more on the school, and also you know that right there. I cannot tell you how many guns have been worked on that bench right wow, there. Wow, that's cool. That's really and and uh, it, it's, it, it just goes to show you, you know, you don't need a lot of space there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, you know what, I did have a question here. Um, since you're talking about all the guns that have seen that, that bench there, what's the most mm -hmm. challenging project you've had as a gunsmith? Oh boy, that's hard. I know. Um, it was the first question I got that I do. Came, came right out of the gate swinging. <laughs> <laughs> there's been quite a few. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of people are probably expect me to say more of your your uh, AKs or ARs or, or something. But believe it or not, it's been some of the very old antique guns 
that were blowback systems or a little bit more technical system that there was no schematics or any kind of information on very rare guns. I have some clients that bring me some very rare things they have collected and it's more probably more of a nervous factor than anything because when you realize they, they like to tell you how much the gun's worth and what they pay. Oh, sure, and I, and sure. And it makes it would be so much easier if they just didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so but but that that's been it. Um, surprisingly enough, what machine guns I've worked on and some other things like that, those are actually pretty easy systems. They're modern systems, and that's and as you know, Jennifer, from the first time we've talked, and Zeke and, and uh, Paul both know this about me too, is I'm very big on systems, right. on knowing the gun systems, the different types of systems, because if you know those systems, then you know you can pretty much figure out any gun out. Where the hard stuff comes in is when you're dealing with very old stuff, and even though it may look simple, some of those guys for their time were very, very smart and actually some very intricate stuff. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, let me... I do have a question here that doesn't really fall into one of our three categories, but... Since we're a school, I'm going to do it because it, it does kind of set us up nicely for this part of the discussion here. Um, oh, hold on. Let me get to it. How would you – now, Darren asks, how would you suggest a person with an interest in gunsmithing but not the education get involved with gunsmithing? How's that for and one up? <laughs> for us, <yeah>. well, <laughs> Thank you, Darren, for asking that question. <laughs> well, Darren, all I can say to Darren is you've got two ways to go, <laughs> and both of them be hard. You yeah. can go in there and try it yourself and do the YouTube way and end up spending lots of money to, to re replace what you have messed up, or <laughs> you can try to get an apprenticeship with a gunsmith who would be willing to teach you everything but that's kind of a, a few and far between thing anymore it's hard to find those anymore right um, YouTube gets a lot of people in trouble and I get a lot of work in my future <laughs> gunsmiths out there and I, and I have a few of them that are listening tonight some of my students and I've told them this you will make money off of YouTube because there's always that person that watches YouTube and they mess their guns up so it, it's one of those deals where I highly suggest getting the basics first. You're going to need to really learn a lot of things because when I was doing it on my own before, I it's, this is why I started studying gunsmithing and going going to, to uh, uh, armors classes and schools mm -hmm. and things was because you know I got tired of paying for stuff I was spoiling. So <laughs> you you have to uh, and you and you got to realize too that there's more to gunsmithing than just replacing parts and fixing a gun. You've got a heavy responsibility on your shoulders. When you're working on somebody else's guns, you're not just working on their guns, they're putting their lives in your hand. Sure. And if you do something wrong, you know, you're going to have to live with the fact that you may have hurt somebody or caused someone to be hurt. And not to mention the legal financial responsibilities oh, sure, are going to sure. come with doing something like that Absolutely. and also you've got to understand too Darren that ATF is leaning more and more every day and the industry we all push this for uh, a minimum of people to graduate to school before they're going to start uh, dealing out the FFLs and with that being said they're not there yet but they're really leaning towards that and looking at that because they get a lot of complaints from people who've been hurt and looking at ways. And, and I don't have to tell everybody out there that there's a lot of changes coming right. for the firearms industry. We see it. We hear it. You know, we got people that are after the firearms industry. And any weakness they can find, they're going to do it. And that, that also pertains to repairs and also, you know, I wasn't going to touch on this yet because I figured the question was coming, but since he asked, you've got to have an FFL to even work on people's guns and right. charge them. Yeah. So, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. I've had a couple FFL questions. And again, um, it's not like I expect you to be the end-all, be-all on details of the FFL, but we have had a couple people say, when, do you, when should you get it? 
Um, you know, do you need it if you're just working out of your home and things like that? Do you have any information? And I will say as well, as part of our programs, we do have a huge part of our curriculum that goes over gun laws, regulations, getting an FFL, et cetera. We do also have a partnership with FFL 123 um, that will give you a discount. If you, if you purchase their FFL 123 kit on the SDI website, um, you get it, you get a good chunk of change off of it. So there is information. We as a school think that's important that you guys are a hundred percent aware of what you're supposed to be doing as far as regulations go. That's, that's something yes. that you do have to pass in order to graduate. Um, but beyond that, you know, just for the purposes of tonight, um, we've had a person ask when you got your FFL, like, was it before or after you went through these courses um, and that type of thing? Well, when I got my FFL is when I decided to open the business. Um, the laws have changed over the the years and different sure. requirements have come into play. Sure. But by the time I was ready to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to semi-retire and I'm going to open up a business. Uh, it, yeah, it's a requirement. I don't care if you charge the customer one penny, you better have that FFL. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the ATF, I have never known them to be a problem at all. Yeah. But I also know if you break their rules, that can be your worst nightmare. Right. And there's a reason they have those rules, and that's to protect the public. Okay, it's not to make a burden on us. Their their main goal, the way that they're structured and what they they believe in their function, is to protect the public, to uh, you know make sure everybody's on the up and up. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, um, I don't advocate, and like I said, these are just my opinions, and the SDI and I are on the same wavelength here. We can only tell you, I can only tell you about my personal experience. I strongly suggest going, you know, talking to somebody like FFL123, talking to your lawyer and talking to your CPA for your tax things. Mm -hmm. um, these are the people that, that you know, hold the, the legal um, education that I don't have on a lot of things. So, but with my experience, um, I got my FFL and I had no problem getting an FFL. They had no problem coming to my house. They had no problem approving my property. They had no problem at all, none whatsoever. In fact, the the agent that came here ended up being a good friend. So, yeah, that's good. you know, it just it yeah, it just goes to show you. And 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 I'll tell you guys another thing. It's um, I'm one of those people that likes to ask a lot of questions, just like you guys are asking me questions, and I, I ask questions too. And there's no dumb question. And I found them to be a great source and answer any questions and even today I can call and say hey I'm not sure about this what what's what's the ruling on this where where can I find it and because they're gonna give you a book with all their rules and regulations and laws and you know unless you're a lawyer good luck understanding a lot of that <laughs> but but you can call them and ask them ask a field agent and they'll be more than happy to answer questions um, I, I give you for instance when we go to shop show, or if we go to some of the firearm industry shows, they're they're usually there and have a panel of agents there that will answer anything you have to ask. So yeah. don't be afraid to ask questions. And they also have a whole bunch of uh, frequently asked questions on their website. And you can you know you'll probably find a lot of what you're looking for right there. It's already been answered for you if you just take the time to research it. Yeah. And, and one follow-up question here is, should you have your shop basically preset before applying for an FFL? And I know that you can, you know, until you start exchanging money for these services, uh, that's fine. But do you, in your opinion, yeah, would you have it all set up first? I, it, I would have it at least laid out. And there's not even a requirement for that. Yeah. Basically, what they, what they do when they come to see you and do an interview is they have already done your background checks. Mm -hmm. And what they want to do is actually come see the physical property. They want to see that you have everything you said you had in your application. It all checks out. And then what they do is they set you down, and they're going to spend about two hours to three hours with you. And they're going to go over everything that you need to know within those two or three hours and you're going to sign a piece of paper saying that you understand 
and accept it. And they're going to give you your book, and they're going to tell you, and you're going to sign a paper saying that you understand it's your responsibility to read that book and to read those regulations and know them. So the point I'm getting at with you is that's their main reason they do the interview. And they're going to go over several things, do's and don'ts. And yes, you're not going to be able to probably absorb it all. And that's where the reading comes in. And that's also where call them up and ask them follow-up questions. Yeah, I, I think anything you can do to cover your own you-know-what <laughs> is a smart sure. thing when it comes to the ATF. And that's the same thing with all aspects of the business. Anything that, that could put you out of business, licensure, insurance, anything like that, bring in the big guns, ask the experts, you know. Absolutely. I think that's Absolutely. the smartest way to do it. So. It's like I, like I said at the last seminar, the, the smartest thing that I ever did when I got into this business yeah, I know was, I was asking questions to the ATF. Mm -hmm. The ATF was, was great about that. When it came time at the end of the year to file my taxes, I hired a CPA. When it, when it, you know, I also, before I even contacted ATF when I filled out the application, I went to a lawyer and I paid him about $150 just to go over some basic things and, and advise me of, about liability issues. And then you can go from there. And then, you know, then there's insurance questions and you can ask the insurance companies. I think I touched on it before when I was on here. The NRA has insurance programs that are affordable for liability. And they'll be happy to talk to you and answer any question you got. Good. I was just going to ask that. We had a couple people say, hey, what kind of insurance do I need and where do I find it? So you would recommend the, the end, starting with the NRA? Well, yes. And um, I should have. You know, I don't like to endorse a lot of things, sure. as you know. Yeah. Um, I try to stay with the people that we do business with at SDI because we we know about them and they've been checked out thoroughly. But I don't think that that Zeke or Paul have a problem with that. Uh, the NRA, yes, definitely. Yeah. We um, I found them to be very affordable, very low down payment, and they cover you for quite a bit. And let's face it, guys, you're in the firearms business, so. If you're going to have somebody come after you for a firearms-related lawsuit, who better than to have an insurance <laughs> policy that's through the NRA? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. This is a little bit different, but still kind of setting up shop stuff. We've bounced around a little bit, so that's fine. Sure. Um, promoting and advertising a startup. How do you decide? Now, you and I talked last month about knowing your audience you know, deciding on your demographic. How do you reach out to those people? How do you get the word out? How do you promote, you know, advertise your company and that type of thing? Any tips and tricks? Well, there's, there's lots of ways to do it. There's the money ways and there's not the money ways. Right. Um, you know, first of all, let me say this. You can't be lazy. Right. And you can't be shy. You need to go out and, and when there's a turkey dinner, you know, like the, the uh, Turkey Federation, go to the Turkey Federation. It will behoove you to get to know these different groups, whether it's a deer hunting yep. uh, type place or whether it's a, just a shooting club, like a gun club. Get to know the people when they have a function, show up at the functions, have a handful of cards with you, shake hands. Don't be obnoxious, but be nice when you strike up a conversation. Hey, by the way, you know, I'm... I'm you know, American Gunsmith is my business. Here's my card. If you ever need anything, let me know. Be happy to work with you. And don't over push the issue. Nobody likes a pussy person, but people like it when they get a card or some information of somebody they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And you're also going to find out that people like to support local businesses. So once you that's that's the way to really get started. Your local newspaper is another great way to get started because mm -hmm. you're letting everybody know on whatever ad you take out, whether it be a Sunday morning ad or whatever, uh, when they read that paper or over eating their bacon in the morning, they say, hey, sure. we got a gun in town. Great. And and from so a market, you know, it. sorry to interject, but sure. I wanted to kind of back you up on this. From a, I, I work in the marketing department, and so that my whole thing is knowing your audience. And the, the things that you just named off are very closely aligned with your demographic. You know what I mean? So you, you're looking for people who want to 
uh, you know, support small businesses and read the newspaper. That's that's the perfect people to to go and talk to. And the people that have an interest in the industry, the turkey guys, the state rifle association guys, that all that networking sure. that's industry specific, those are that's exactly the right way to do it. You know. Well, yeah, and, and, and the kind of things I'm talking about is things that are just common sense. Right. If somebody's having an event somewhere, like a sportsman show, a lot of local places do local sportsman show, mm -hmm. or if there's a, a gun show, okay, that's another good place. Yep. You know, especially if you're wearing a T-shirt with your business on it, you know, you, I can't tell you how many times I've been stopped at gun shows or other places, and people say, oh, you're a gunsmith. Oh, wow, cool. Is this your shop? Yeah, you got a card? And, it, and uh, it, you know, that kind of thing really goes a long way. People like people to, that have personalities. People like to talk to people. They love yeah. to talk guns. Yep. So if, you, if you're like guns and you're the gunsmith, be prepared because you're going to have people walk up to you and say, hey, let me ask you a question. And that, a lot of times that breaks ice. Now, yes, yeah. that can get a little monotonous when you're, <laughs> you know, not really wanting to give out free information. But sure. you know what I have found? I get more flies with honey than I do vinegar. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I cannot tell you just by answering some little basic questions, the guy will turn around, show up at my house or at the shop, you know, when I had to shop the house or, or in the gun shop up here and say, oh, I brought you three guns. Yeah. Awesome. So <laughs> that happens all the time. Yeah. Now, granted, once your name gets out there, guys, I'm telling you, if you do things right and you do good work and you do fair work at a fair price, trust me when I say this, and I can't I cannot reiterate this enough, your name is going to get out there. And once people know that you're a good smith and everybody is talking about you as far as, oh yeah, he's he's a great guy, man. I'm really glad to have him and this and that. That's going to carry more weight than any kind of advertisement you can buy, because they're going to listen to their buddies when they say, or at the gun range, or anywhere else when they say, "Hey, man, you know, you go out there and see him. He's really a good guy. He's going to treat you right. He's honest. He's fair, and he knows what he's doing." Yeah, absolutely. People are, yeah, and because people, you know, we and, and guys, there's a lot of guys and gals out there now listening that know. That we're very particular about our firearms. Sure. So, it, for one, it's an investment. Guns are not cheap. Right. <laughs> so, sure. So you don't want Joe, you know, blow just just. Well, I watch YouTube, so I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna do a trigger job and blah blah blah, and, and then you got a gun that not only malfunctions but but may blow up your face. Right. So, you know, that's, that's another thing. People are looking for certified quality people, and that's what we do at SDI. Yeah. We give you that basic foundation to get out there and get going with a reputable school behind you, with a reputable name, that have reputable uh, instructors that know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said this in the last seminar, all you have to do is look at the people associated with SDI, both at the school and that also just promote the school and and, and uh, uh, recommend the school. And you see these same faces in gun magazines and everywhere else. Right. Yeah. And we've had a couple questions about education. So let's let me just do a couple questions on that, and then we'll we'll keep moving forward here. Um, did you? First of all, where are your certifications from? You didn't attend SDI. We, we know that. But um, before that, I, where did I've you... I've attended many, many different things, and I don't uh, disclose that because this is an SDR webinar. Sure. And I only discuss what, what pertains to SDI. But okay. Yes, I have several certifications from several places. Yep. And and i got to tell you all something. There's a reason I'm in SDI. <laughs> Well, yeah, and and one student asked here, and we we won't name names, but there's an there's another competitor, and again, SDI's um, viewpoint on this is that there's room in the market for everybody. You know, we we would never bash a competitor, but no. can you is there anything that you can talk to about SDI that, in your opinion, that that SDI does better than some of the other people out there? 
And don't, well, don't, don't have to name names, just, you know. No, and I probably know which school they're talking about, and mm -hmm. I do know them at that school, and I also know uh, that there's some talented people there. But what makes us different is we offer hands-on work. We offer field studies with some of the best in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about Atlas Arms, which was formerly Red Jacket. I'm talking about Barrett. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about several people like that out there, who, are, including myself, who are actual working in the field. You don't get that with the other schools. Right. And those, okay? that's those, one. Yeah, those field studies, um, if, if it comes up again, we'll dive a little bit of, you know, deeper into that. But if anybody has um, questions on what field studies are available or anything like that, what the process would be for that, just to give you a little background on that. Um, those field studies are really cool. They're three to four week on-site hands-on training opportunities. Uh, like Kip said, to go to some of some really cool places within the ind industry. I think we have, uh, I might get this wrong, but I think we have eight different states um, represented on our little field study list. There, there are just over a dozen of them available, I, I do believe. They, they do them all throughout the year. Um, they don't cost our students anything. You have to be a graduate or close to graduating in the associate degree program or the advanced gunsmithing program, um, but there are no additional charge for those students that are selected. It is a selective type of process. You do have to pay for travel and living expenses while you're there, but that's it. We don't, you know, it's not a course through SDI, um, nothing like that. It just kind of offers our guys that little extra something, you know, um, to go hands-on and behind the scenes and, and the couple guys that have done it so far have just raved about them So we're really excited if you do want any information about that email me again Jennifer at sdi.edu and I'll put you in contact with the person who oversees the field study stuff so. Well, and not only that we're, we're The stuff that we're doing is more up-to-date There's a lot of these these places and I'm not knocking anyone because I don't do yeah. that but the stuff has been around since, you know, VHS tapes. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and there's a lot of great information, but a lot of stuff that a lot of the schools are offering it's obsolete. The gun market has changed. The gun industry has changed. The the systems and the way that they make, you know, uh, pistols and stuff have changed. So you you want somewhere that's giving you up to date right. information on lot, lots of different subjects and we do that at SDI right. and we're striving every day. The, the, the students out there don't realize the hours that our research and development people that Paul and right. Zeke and so many of them are out there trying to do and put together and I gotta tell you something. I was one of those people that saw a lot of impressive people that said that were really interested in what SDI had to offer. Right. Okay, and I can't name the names, but but I'm telling sure. the students out there, you you would probably be pretty impressed to know some of these these firearms industry people that thought it was a great program. Yeah. And a lot of them have gotten behind us. A lot of them, you know, have been just way too busy, but you'd be surprised at how many of them they're working with and working on mm -hmm. to get things going. You know, my end of it. Is, is is what I do is is I'm the everyday gunsmith. This is what I do. What I do is what most of you would probably end up doing. Now those of you that become manufacturers and get TV shows and stuff, hey man, that's awesome. And I'll be so proud. I'll be right. so proud to hear <laughs> be able to do that. But the reality is is you know most of you are going to be working gunsmiths. And that that is a, a, a kind of deal. That Function that's on the screen there, talk about promotions too. That is a NRA promotion that we do for friends of the NRA. And that was also a great, great way to meet people and get your name out there. So, you know, just, just I know we kind of drifted into two, two areas right there, but when you guys are promoting, one thing you have to make sure of is Make sure whatever comes out of your mouth, you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Be able to deliver on anything you tell the public. So, you know, I encourage you to study hard and to study, study, study. And never stop learning. 
I don't, you know, I, I'm always learning something new. The industry comes out with something new every year. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you have to, to do that. And, you know, it's up to you to keep your continuing education. We can give you all the meat and potatoes and the basic skills you need to get started in your gunsmithing career, but it's going to be up to you to get out there and apply it and learn and learn and learn. Right. Absolutely. Um, let's shift directions just a little bit. Um, so going back to when you're first starting out, I've had a couple questions come in here that ask about, is it better to specialize on one system or one type of platform, or is it better to generalize when you're first starting out? Well, here's the problem. Um, you're not going to have a lot of choice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you'll when, do, when you'll do what people bring when, to you. <laughs> yes. When, when, you're the, when you're, you hang your seagull out there, if you're the gunsmith, you're going to see everything from little pistols to ARs to AKs to uh, rabbit ear, black powder, you know, type of, of, of uh, shotguns and things that haven't seen the light of day for a hundred years. So you're, you're going to have to be pretty versed. Um, as far as specializing, you can do that, but you have to ask yourself, okay, I'm not going to do anything but 1911s. But how many 1911 guys is there in your town that's going to support you? And how are you going to find them? And, yeah. and that's the thing, you know. And how many of them really is there? Because what you find with a lot of guys is a lot of a lot of guys are pretty apt to doing a lot of stuff they like to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're the average gunsmith, people expect you to be able to work on anything. Right. And that's because they think of you just like a a uh, a blacksmith in the old days, you know. They expected the blacksmith to be able to make whatever they needed. Well, they right. expect the gunsmith to be able to fix whatever they bring them. And you may see guns, and, and I'm not kidding you guys when I tell you this. I've seen everything from the most modern gun to the most relic gun of a flintlock pistol. And, you know, you when you're working on a gun that's a basic system like that, you, you need to be really confident in what you're doing because you might be working on a gun that's worth several thousands of dollars. Right. And, and I have done that. And i got to tell you guys, that can be very nerve-wracking. I believe it. Um, how about, since we're kind of talking about what to build and how to serve people, um, so we're in the third tier now, for those of you <laughs> keeping track, even though we've completely bounced all around. Um, in your opinion, so you've got the NRA instructor certification. Is that yes. a good angle? Is that something that other people, you know, do you, do you build all these certifications, but specifically this NRA instructor one? Is that a good angle for other people to take as part of their business? Well, I think so. I give you guys an example. I teach basic ballistics. Right. At FCI. Right. That's, well, that's one of the courses I teach. I also teach the AR-10 course. Mm -hmm. But the basic uh, ballistics course that I teach, well, you know, I, I've got a lot of reloading skills I've done in the past, but it also helps knowing that I'm a reloading instructor trained by the NRA in both shotguns and metallic cartridges. So I feel very confident in what I'm teaching my, my uh, students. So I think that any, any kind of education you can get is always a benefit. Um, even if it's just for your own knowledge, you know, uh, one of the reasons that I got into the instructor thing was uh, I had thought about, you know, if you have a range, that's the first thing. You're going to need a range to go to. But I had lots of people approaching me because they knew my background. My background, there was a lot of training that I received and very specialized training. Mm -hmm. And one of the needs, just like everybody else I saw, was people are going out and getting concealed carry permits in record numbers. And if you can offer that, that's just a little bit more you've got to offer the public. And I cannot tell you, I get calls all the time, you know, do you, do you teach classes? Right. <laughs> you know, so, and, and uh, they're looking for several things. Um, people, people that don't know, look to you to teach them, just like you guys may look to us to teach you about gunsmithing. 
if you're the firearms instructor, they're coming to you because they really want to know because you're going to find people that have never held a gun in their life. Right. But because of the way things are going in this world, they're scared. And they're looking for professional people that can instruct them correctly. And, and most of all, they want to be safe. And, you know, so yeah, that any, any of those kind of things you could do like that is an extra benefit and a feather in your cap. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the things you mentioned in this in this last, what we were just talking about, um, what's your opinion on starting a range? You know, if a guy were to go out and start a range, what are the... If, listen, if you can afford it... I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> if you can afford to have it, or, or well, I, I just give an example. I mean, if, mainly it comes down to, to property. To, see, there's so many instructors out there that you're going to find that most of the ranges are booked up. Yeah. Okay, and in my little town alone, I bet you there's 200 instructors in this entire county, and they all try to get on every range they can. Well, the problem is, is you can't always get range time. Right. So, if you're going to go that route, that's one of the things you're going to have to consider. Will I be able to have a range available for me to be a firearms instructor? Second of all, if you want to have your own range and you can afford to do so, whether it be an outdoor range, an indoor range, whatever it is you're wanting to do, um, if you've got the land and the, and the place to do it and the zoning that will let you do it, hey, go for it. That's up. That's if that's what you want to do. Right. I'm sure it would make your life easier. It just kind of depends mm -hmm. on startup costs. Okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a couple questions here that um, are pertaining to charges. Um, the first one is, how do you decide how much to charge for your services? Well, there, there again, that's kind of a tough question, they're, and they're right, and I understand. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I've talked to Zeke about this, and, and we're working together on a few things. Uh, my machinist, Robert, and we've discussed it as well, mm -hmm. but I'm working on a flat rate book system that's better than anything that's out there. Um, there, there's a school that offers one, and I paid the money to get one. I was very disappointed in it. There is no body out there who really has done anything like that because a lot of gunsmiths don't want you to know. Right. They don't want you to be successful because they don't want any competition. So you, what I would suggest is. And, and it may sound a little sneaky, but you might want to go if if and just price the other guy out. I'm just going to call it like it is. <laughs> ah, the you, old secret shopper. <laughs> you, know, you may have to do that, you know, because because they're going to do it to you anyway. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you that right now, because everybody wants to know. But if if you're apprenticing with a, a gunsmith, you can kind of learn it that way. See what they charge. But, you, but one thing I tell people is don't price yourself out. If you look online at a lot of the gunsmiths uh, shops that do it online, mm -hmm. well, they might live, they might be in a demographic that, that you know, the average household makes a medium of, of $60,000 a year. Right. Okay. But in your little town, it may not even be half of that. Right. So if you price yourself out of your market, they're not going to come. You know, do you want to do three guns a year or do you want to do 150 guns a year? Right. And that kind of thing. And that's what you kind of got to feel out. It's, it's kind of a thing you have to, to um, uh, feel out yourself. Sure. And, and uh, it, it, it's, it's tough. It is tough. And I understand that. And I know there's no – I can't just come on here and give you a clear-cut way to do things. You know, right. you have to decide um, – Every gunsmith, you know, the more you get known as a gunsmith and the more uh, you're known in the industry, you can charge more. You can command more because they know your reputation, they know you work. Um, but when you're first starting out, guys, you, you just don't price yourself out of the market, but don't give it away either. You got to, you're trying to make a living if you are. Now, those of you who may do it part-time as a hobby or just to make a little extra income, you're probably not as worried about that as most are, but, you know, I would say on average, no matter where you live, the minimum that you should charge would be no less than $30 an hour. 
That's good. That's helpful. Now, no, and, and and with that being said, now keep in mind that just about every time you go in town, your mechanic probably gets you know, seventy-five to one hundred dollars. Right. An hour. <laughs> right. So you know, and, and the attorney is going to get two hundred of them. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, you have to understand that you're 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 making an investment when you go to school. But here's what I want you guys to understand: when you get that certificate, whether it's the associate's degree or the gunsmith certificate, you are telling the people, "I made this effort." to get all the education I could to serve you better. And I can do the work and I'm confident and you know that I can do the work so therefore this is what I charge. Now, people may grovel sometimes but they're going to come back and get it done because they want it done professionally. Right. And they want it done right. And another thing I will tell you guys is stay with a guarantee behind your work. Everything that you, you guys will ever see on me it, on every yeah. advertising I do, yeah. I put on there that I do it all, I do it right, 100% guaranteed. And I stick to that through, don't matter. And knock on wood, I don't have things come back to the shop, but I've had guys down the road that said, hey, you know, you fixed my uh, extractor six months ago and it started doing it again. Well, let me bring it in, let me look at it for free. Right. And let me see why. And then usually you find out it's another problem. Something else has happened. They may have even broken it don't even know it. Right. So treating your customers like that, they're not going to they're not going to mind you making your living. Okay? In fact, they're going to want you to make your living. When I finally shut this this last big building down that I had to get the overhead off me, um, I had customer after customer call me and say, "You did where, where are you at, man? You, <laughs> you didn't leave, did you?" No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I didn't leave. I'm everything's great. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So I mean that's just the way it goes, and, and you know you just have to you just have to uh, treat people the way you'd want to be treated, and and some things you're not even going to charge by the hour. You're going to look at it and say, well, you know, they brought the gun to me, and I paid five dollars for the part, and it took me five minutes. So you may not want to charge them that full hour. You might say, you know what, I think this is fair. And you tell that to your customer, you know, this is what I get an hour, but this is what I did, so here's what I'm going to charge it. And man, you know, when they when you do things like that, that makes them come back. I've actually had them done it a couple of times, and they come back with two days later with with more guns. So, cool. <laughs> you know, and getting getting those people to bring more back that's that's the, that's the secret right there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I know we're out of time here, but there is one more pricing question that I wanted to get to. Is it okay to charge for the part before and the rest after the after the repair? Yes, yes. You you have to figure out what your parts are going to cost you, and it's okay, especially when you're starting out and you don't have a lot of capital. You can go ahead and do that, and go ahead and charge them accordingly, and and uh, get, you know ask them to pay up front. And there's two reasons for this. And explain it to them this way. This is what, you know, first of all, it may be a part that you, that maybe you're not too worried about. I'll go ahead and order it because it's a common gun and I'll use it down the road. There's no doubt. Right. But on a gun that, that you know that you, like say it's a 1940 Stevens 22 and the part costs you a little bit and you, you need to ask yourself, well, you know, because it doesn't happen often, but sometimes people order parts and then you never see them again. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, so to keep yourself from having to go through the whole return thing and to uh, uh, go through that hassle, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay to charge them parts up front, especially especially if that's all they're having you do, because sometimes you'll have people say, hey, I can put it in myself, just order me to part. Yeah. But re remember to whatever your part costs you to mark it up a little bit. You're not in this business to give things away. You're in this business to make money. Right. So, you know, charge accordingly. Now, I'm not saying on a $3 part, charge them $100. But, you know, if it's if it's a $3 part, charge them 6 Yeah. Cause, yeah. You know, cause you get, because usually there's some shipping involved in there, too. So. Well, and, and not only that, um, you're spending your time searching for that part and making the order. So, you know, you still have to pick if you're working eight hours a day and you're spending two of those hours tracking stuff down for your clients and you're not Absolutely. making any money during that time. That's, you know, I think that is an important consideration. 
Absolutely. Now we have a partner in parts, and I can use this Brownells. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you guys this: as you get into this business and you start working, Brownells will give you a discount for being part of SDI. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of other places that, too. Mm -hmm. Sure. And it, yeah, there is. There's several others. But I'm just using them as an example. Yeah. Um, because they sell a lot of your gunsmithing tools as well. So, um, but there's also a program they offer us or you can pay a fee, and I can't remember exactly what the fee is. It's not a whole lot of money, but you get free shipping for a whole year. Oh, cool. So no matter what you order, you're going to get free shipping. So that's a, that's a great thing, too. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, okay, so I, we're going to need to wrap it up pretty soon here. I did have a couple questions come in at the very end. Um, that, Go ahead. That are, I, 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 I take as much time <laughs> as you need. You're so good at that. Jennifer, I really right? appreciate that. Um, do you have an appropriate markup percentage at all, a ballpark? It just, it just depends. Yeah. Um, I, you know, you hear people say, well, you should do 100% markup. Well, sometimes there, there's lots of things that you can't mark up real high. You, you, you've got to keep things affordable. If I bring you a $75 gun and it's going to cost me 150 parts, I'm probably not going to have you do the work. Yeah. But if, if I can put 30 bucks in parts and, and I can still make a little bit of money, even if I make 4 bucks, I'm happy on right. the parts because, because they still have to pay me my labor. Right. Okay, so I'm making money. So I would rather have... 100% of something and 100% of nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. A um, couple questions on education, and this is probably a good way to wrap it up since it, you know, kind of brings it full circle. Um, we've had some guys say, you know, I've got the, the associate degree. Should I also do the armorers courses? Or one guy said, you know, um, would it be, worth, in your opinion, why is education important and things like that? Can you... Can you kind of wrap us up here on your thoughts on how to make the most of your education or how important it is to do something like SDI? And that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be SDI, but, you know, gunsmithing education in general. Okay. Why is it important to get education? Because education, the knowledge you get is power. And when you have that power of that knowledge, that power translates into skill. And that skill is what's going to separate you from all the others out there that do not have that skill. Any education, I don't care if you have an associate's degree or whatever you have, anything that I have taken course after courses and on the same gun. Now, I may know that firearm in and out. But I'll take, the, but I'll, like, for instance, when the, uh, we do an armorer's class, like Glock or, 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 or uh, Barrett, mm -hmm. I'm a Barrett certified armorer. Whenever Barrett has something new that's going to come out, I want to know about it. If there's a new, even though I may know everything about that rifle, if there's a new way of doing something, I want to know about it. Because that, that little extra is what puts me over the edge on the next guy. So it's the true with any kind of firearm you do, and anything you can learn is worth it. Now, you have to ask yourself, you know, how, how skilled and how good do I want to be? Well, me, when I got into this, I made the decision that I wanted to be, you know, everything I could know about firearms. I wanted to be that guy that could pick up a gun, and fix it even if I'd never even seen one before. And knock on wood, that has happened, and it has happened because of the education. Okay? Yep. And like I said, it translates into skill. And that should be there. Now, do I believe in SDI? You bet you I do. Mm -hmm. I put my reputation on SDI, and I am continually trying to figure out ways to help SDI grow and become better and better and better. I'm 52 years old and I'm hoping that good Lord willing that Zeke and Paul let me stay around here till I'm 78 years old <laughs> because I want to continue to, to help grow this school and come up with things. There's lots of things that we're working on that we don't even discuss yet but Zeke and I, I will give you a little hint, 
we are talking about doing a series of videos just on systems and other things like that so you guys can see things hands on. Right. Okay, the more you can get, because I know some of you learn better visually than you do through books, but we want to offer both and we also want to keep the hands on. Do you guys out there know any other school? And I don't care if it's a campus-based school or not. Where can you go to another school that they give you a 1911 to build, or they give you an <laughs> AR to build, or they give you, or or they give you uh, a new Hornady press to get reloading and stuff? I don't know of any school out there. We're the only ones doing that. So, and there's a reason for that. You're reading it. You're learning it. You put your hands on it. That education equals skill. Awesome. Very good. Okay. That's SDI. That's SDI. <laughs> awesome. Awesome as usual. Um, I think that's it. I think that, I mean, there, there are some other ads and ends and what I'll do for, for anybody who didn't have a question answered, what I'll do is I'll just try to compile a little list um, and we'll see if we can't uh, get with Kip on the back end. And maybe we'll even do a little Q and A not an ebook, but something that we can send out and just say, hey, these are the things that we didn't get to. Maybe they didn't fall into one of the <laughs> tiers very well. Um, and that type of thing. We want to make sure that everybody has their questions answered. But sure. um, but we've covered the big stuff for sure. And I really, really appreciate you doing this for us again, Kip. I think we'll wow. really like it. So well, listen, I, I am thrilled to do this and I'm here to do this anytime that the school, yourself, or your students want it. Um, there was a question earlier too that, that they said well why SDI well let me tell you something guys my phone number is well known you can find me on Facebook or anywhere else and my emails are well known there's not many schools that you can go to a guy like myself the instructors and ask them any question you want to and don't get mad right. when you call them up yep. you know, I, I challenge you if you want to do that feel free to call and ask me questions I don't have a problem with that especially if you're an SDI student we're here for the students and we want them to understand that that's what we think makes us a lot different than a lot of other people out there that, that have these other schools right you can actually call us and get an answer absolutely yeah and if anybody needs anything from from any of us I can I can put you in contact with Kip if you and again I'll say it for like the 50th time my email address is Jennifer at SEI.edu <laughs> Um, or the admissions line, if you guys want to jot this down too, if you have questions, specific questions on the programs or the differences between the programs, pricing, that type of thing, um, the admissions direct line so that you don't have to go through the campus and be buzzed around is 844 2380165. Um, so if you need anything from them, you can call them directly. Um, we have, if you're a vet, we have a lot of vets actually on the admissions team. Um, anybody is happy to help you over there. We all work as a big old family here. So if I can help you with anything, let me know. I'd be happy to get you in contact with Kip or get you any other resources that we talked about tonight. Um, or of course you can reach out to admissions directly. So. Um, Kip, again, thank you so much for your time, and I think this has been another, this part two has been just, just as successful as part one, so I really appreciate it. Awesome. Um, and everybody who, everybody who has attended, I really appreciate your time as well, especially considering the World Series is on. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I do thank you, and just a heads up, I will be editing this video and then hopefully getting it on the Facebook page and the YouTube page in the next day or two. That's typically how long it takes me to get these things up and running. So keep an eye out for Facebook. We're doing a big old giveaway on Facebook right now as well. So um, that's a good place to kind of spend some time anyway if you want to try to win some cool stuff. <laughs> um, but other than that, I'll get this recording up for you um, and also emailed out as soon as possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Have a great night. And we'll talk to you maybe uh, next webinar. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.